Welcome to the Season 1 finale of Innovation 19, Episode 2, Inside Today's Robots, Mind, Body, and Soul. In our last episode, we talked about artificial intelligence, or the robotic mind. And today, we're looking at the physical forms that AI can inhabit. Thanks, R2. I grew up surrounded by a lot of different representations of robots in media. We had killer bots like Terminator, friendly bots like R2-D2, and humanoid androids like the replicants in Blade Runner. It was confusing as a kid. I wasn't sure what robots would look like when the robotic revolution finally came. Like, would they be evil? Would they be sassy? Would they be made of gleaming, shiny metal? Or would they just look like us? Well, today's episode is all about the physical robots that inhabit our world. As we look at the latest tech and everything from e-commerce robots to media and entertainment bots, we're going to continue asking the question, where do robots fit into our human experience? And today's episode is all about the body of the robot as part of our series on robots, mind, body, and soul. Okay, for all the wonder, mystery, and hype surrounding robots, the definition of a robotic body is simple. It's any machine typically programmed by a computer and capable of carrying out a complex series of actions. We tend to think of robots as humanoid, probably because of what's been shown to us in fiction and maybe because of a little psychological projection. But most robots actually look nothing like humans, even though they typically carry out or assist human behaviors and actions. Let's talk about service bots first. Service bots are the hardworking, people-first robots. A few years ago, a video went viral of a service bot by Boston Dynamics named Atlas. In the clip, Atlas, the robot, is jumping over boxes up to five feet in the air, doing backflips. He looks like a headless C-3PO if C-3PO benched like 300. But Boston Dynamics characterizes Atlas as a humanoid, a robot that has human-like physical traits. He's designed to do what humans do just better. In a sense, a lot of robots are replacing the physical limitations of humans. And the more humans get accustomed to bots doing labor for them, the more they expect it in the future. Boston Dynamics realizes this, so they have several robots available for purchase that are designed to replace human work. They have a robot called Spot, who looks very much like a headless dog, and his goal is to inspect and capture data, especially on dangerous locales like construction sites or military zones. There's also a robot called Handle, which is a bot that can move boxes in a warehouse with ease. And there's another robot called Pick. And Pick uses deep learning, that's a type of machine learning or AI, to recognize a variety of boxes by their SKU numbers and then process them accordingly. Noticing anything that Spot, Handle, and Pick have in common? All of these bots are built to be perfect for e-commerce. Amazon is the most famous company to utilize robotics in their massive, massive product warehouses. And to get a sense of how massive, as of 2019, they had over 200,000 robots. Yes, that number was correct. Amazon has over 200,000 robots working for them in warehouses. They mainly use small, flat, round robots called drives that carry boxes to humans. And then human employees can take over processing the parcels and the work gets more specialized for the humans to handle, but the robots handle repetitive tasks and moving things around. Now, the image of a warehouse full of little robots instantly brings up fear in me. I don't know about you, but if if you start thinking about 200,000 robots like communicating with each other and AI enters the picture, they decide they don't need the other humans who are on the floor with them. I don't know. I mean, I've seen movies like this. Joking aside, though, I mean, there is a real fear that people feel like Robots could replace human labor altogether and displace hundreds of thousands of people. And you have to ask yourself, is there a robot worker-fueled economic shift in our near future? And the not-so-comforting answer is probably yes. According to Fortune, projections say that over the next 15 years, automation could replace 40% of human jobs. And according to The Verge, Fully automated Amazon warehouses are at least a decade away, but that day is closing in on us very quickly. And that's because robots don't need salaries or labor unions. E-commerce benefits enormously from having robots do the bulk of tedious, energy-zapping, or even dangerous work because humans then can focus on more nuanced tasks or simply overseeing the robot. 
But wow, I mean, doesn't the image of a lone human manager commanding a small army of worker bots feel like the beginning of a sci-fi movie? Now, besides service bots, there are industrial cleaning bots that are another incredibly important piece of the future of enterprise, as well as TV and film production. Cleaning bots aren't exactly new because many of us know about and probably own or maybe have heard a friend annoyingly brag about their Roomba. Do you have a Roomba? It's a little robot vacuum. They've sold 30 million of these things since they launched in 2002. They've become a fairly well-known robot and standard part of life for anybody who owns a a Roomba. I doubt anybody even thinks of their Roomba as a robot. It's just a normal part of tidying up. And now, the next evolution of cleaning robots, after a pandemic world, is going to be even more serious. Because in a world where pandemic safety is paramount, it's vital that surfaces and spaces are meticulously clean. So that brings us to disinfecting bots. My personal favorite is LG's Chloe Bot, which utilizes UVC light to sanitize spaces like restaurants, hotels, sound stages, or convention centers. And cleaning bots are more precise than humans can ever be, as well as withstand levels of UV that humans cannot. Now, as long as we're talking about service bots, we have to spend some time on drones. I was a kid who loved to play with remote control helicopters, and I love drones. Drones are used in a variety of sectors, but I think the coolest is camera work for film and television. Now, in the past, it would have cost a filmmaker tens of thousands of dollars to rent giant cranes or helicopters to get shots for a movie or TV show that a drone gets today without breaking a sweat. And that means that production budgets can be used in new ways. It also means that lower budget productions can get stellar footage and establishment shots. And in this way, drones, kind of like sophisticated camera phones, have contributed to the democratization of modern day filmmaking. But drones can be key in higher budget productions as well. The first major use of aerial cinematography with a drone was the James Bond movie Skyfall in 2012. If you remember that movie, there were shots that were captured that audiences had never seen before because to do so without drones would have just been nearly impossible. And while a lot of drones are remote controlled, there are some that are powered by AI and they use computer vision and they're actually truly autonomous robots. It's especially this type of drone that can pose a lot of new and tricky questions for the FAA, uh, or if you're not in the U.S., the Federal Aviation Administration. The biggest one is that Does a drone count as an aircraft? Because if so, should a drone have to follow the same rules as other small crafts? Expect these debates to only increase in years to come, especially as Amazon has stated that they want nothing more than to make Amazon Prime airborne. And that brings us to another type of bot, which is the delivery bot. The delivery bot, which now walks the streets, but will one day take to the sky. There are companies like DoorDash who have already launched some delivery bots in urban centers like San Francisco. And if you've never seen a delivery bot, for now, they kind of look like a mini fridge on wheels. They can carry up to 22 pounds, which is a lot of chili cheese fries. And they also lock, so they keep anybody that might try to steal the food inside these little droids out. Listen, I cannot wait for the day when one of these delivery bots arrives at my house with a delivery. And you'll know when it happens because I will get plenty of selfies with it. I'll post it on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, etc. I mean, that's the future. Now, like e-commerce bots, we can project the ubiquity of delivery bots within 10 to 20 years, mostly because there's a ton of capital going into this. Venture capitalists have poured an estimated $1 billion into the development of delivery bots. And while they're adorable, they do have to move very slowly And like a Roomba, they can get stuck. So if you go onto YouTube, search delivery bots, and you will see people helping delivery bots out of tough corners. Humans are very willing to help a little droid in need. Even though we logically understand that it's not a sentient being, the charity of the humans helping the delivery bots is really remarkable. And with AI, sometimes we can't help but project our own humanity onto these robots. I mean, they're not human. But go to YouTube and you'll see that most of us act like they are and we treat them like they are. Now, rideshare drivers are another potential job that is going to be inevitably replaced by self-driving cars. And we don't think about that very much. But a car is a robot of sorts, right? It has an AI mind, certainly has a body. If you were watching the Super Bowl this year, you may have seen the self-driving Lincoln car commercial where an Edward Scissorhands type character finally finds peace in his self-driving car. And more and more car companies are offering this feature. So it looks like robots are trying to replace us at work and on our commute 
But what about at home? Home and personal robots are the kind we've all secretly waited for since we saw Rosie on the Jetsons. I see personal use robots as distinct from server bots because they're not designed for industrial or commercial use, but rather to enrich our lives at home and to learn our behaviors on a personal level. In fact, according to Robot Report, social robotics, which is what they call this, is forecasted to expand to more than half a billion dollars by 2023. And that's largely driven by growing demands of an aging in place market that's expected to reach nearly 100 million people just here in the U.S. by 2060. In other words, as millennials age, they're going to want more and more robotics and voice controlled pals to help be their assistants and do chores around the house. And if having a robot butler in your house seems like a fantasy, I'm pleased to tell you that they have already arrived. At CES this year, Samsung launched a new line of house bots for your homemaking needs. My personal favorite is their Bot Handy robot. The Bot Handy can pour you a glass of wine and or do the dishes. I mean, what else is there to desire in life? And if you need someone to talk to, no problem, because social robots exist. A huge innovation moment occurred in 2014 with the creation of Jibo. Jibo was heralded as this first ever social robot for the home. And Jibo looked like a big nesting doll with a round screen face. It could recognize your face, dance to music, ask you questions about your day, and control smart lights in your home. But this robot was connected to a specific Jibo server and the price point was high. In fact, it was around $1,000. Meanwhile, AI assistant competitors like Alexa or Google Home were more affordable and they're plugged into larger data ecosystems. So in 2019, sadly, Jibo called it quits. In fact, according to a Wired article, here's Jibo in 2019 delivering his own eulogy. So sad. Poor little Jibo. If that broke your heart, there are some other cute little robots out there that you can adopt today. If you're looking for a hypoallergenic, easy to care for pet option, for example, then robot pets exist for you. The company Ageless Innovation offers joy for all companion pets. They make both cat and dog options. And while great for kids, they're specifically geared to the elderly population, particularly those in nursing homes. They have a golden pup robot, as an example. The golden pup robot has soft fur that can be brushed. He recognizes and responds to voices. And he even has a heartbeat that you can feel and that makes him seem lifelike. And when he's not in use, the robotic pet simply sleeps. These bots are really fun and they're comforting. And they show that robots aren't just a nice-to-have tech innovation, but they can have a real healing and comforting effect on humans. Of course, I prefer the real thing, but there is a robot in case you have allergies. Caregiving and soothing robots, too, will continue to grow in popularity. The United Nations actually says that we are going to have 2.1 billion people over the age of 60 years old by 2050. So 30 years from now, 2.1 billion people over 60 years old, most having been raised with their computer technology of some type uh, and ready to embrace robotic caregivers. And that could really change the way that we care for an elderly population. But I think the biggest way that robots will affect our day-to-day -day lives and our personal consumption habits are in the small ways. Like robotic wearables. Now, I realize that robots are usually thought of as distinct from humans, but wearables are already making us as a society rethink where technology ends and where humanity begins. We're already tied to our phones. Millions of human wrists have smart trackers now like Fitbits and Apple Watches. I'm a huge fan of Apple, love their hardware, love their ability to make high-tech fashionable, and it seems like every week there's a new leak or a rumor about the new high-tech specs. The Apple glasses will likely allow for a wearer's prescription to be included in the glasses themselves and they'll work by communicating with your iOS device. Don't expect them though before like 2022 end of year 2023 at the earliest. Before then Apple will be launching a VR headset as a competitor to the Oculus Quest 2 which we'll touch on in a moment. Now I understand why Apple is waiting to launch their AR glasses until they're perfect we all remember Google Glass. It was a big failure. Google Glasses did not allow users to interact with spaces in a 3D or integrated way. They were just like a computer screen over your face. And they allowed you to film other people without their knowledge, which created a huge rallying cry of privacy concerns. 
They were launched in 2013. Google Glass uh, was the original name. And the futuristic design of Google Glasses became kind of the butt of a lot of jokes. And they just weren't good looking. So the smart glasses market, tail between their legs, is trying to correctly do this this time. Bose had a really interesting success with their wearable Bose frames, which are sunglasses with built-in headphones. And these allowed users to discreetly listen to music while also being able to hear the world around them. And of course, they look super rad in the process. Snapchat has spectacles eyewear, but the real game changer will be truly smart AR glasses, which Apple, Facebook, and Google are all developing in competition with each other. The arrival of a well-designed pair of smart glasses will usher in a new era for how we work, communicate, and consume media. The future of the internet is the spatial web. In other words, the internet was not designed to be flat, but rather three-dimensional, And content creators are going to start thinking about making content that can exist in 3D. That's why we talk about 3D and VR production and AR production on Innovation 19, because it's going to fit into our lives in an incredible way when smart glasses come around into the mainstream. But until augmented reality wearables get to that long-awaited place, the best alternative reality is the virtual kind, which brings me to robots for entertainment purposes. Let's start with gaming. Gaming is the largest sector of the entertainment industry. In fact, the gaming industry altogether generated $180 billion in 2020, and that's more than the North American sports industry and worldwide movie industry combined. While the biggest generators of revenue are definitely at-home platform consoles like PlayStation and Xbox, virtual reality is a sector of the industry that had a little bit of a bumpy beginning, but it's growing rapidly now. There are 68 million VR headsets that were sold in 2020, virtual reality headsets, and that was largely boosted by new, cost-friendly, no computer hardware required headsets and a pandemic that kept everybody indoors and kept people eager to go as close to in real life, IRL, as possible. The three biggest players in virtual reality are HTC, Sony, and Oculus, which is Facebook. Facebook launched Oculus in 2014, and today the Oculus Quest 2, which is their lightweight, computer-free hardware, is all the more useful and relevant. And people have been using these headsets for more than just gaming. Over the last year, fashion labels and media companies have begun including Oculus Quests, which are priced at around $300 with tickets to events. And if you've ever been to a gaming convention, you've probably seen a giant immersive VR setup where players hold these haptic plastic weapons and they have full body suits in addition to their VR headsets so that it really feels like they're in the game. These are full body experiences of a game and they're pretty awesome. It feels like you're on an underwater adventure or flying to an alien planet. And if you ever have an opportunity to try this out for yourself once the pandemic is over, I highly recommend it. But until then, at-home VR headsets for entertainment, art, fitness are a great alternative In my mind, VR headsets are just a hop and a skip away from a conversation about cyborgs because there are actually already advocate groups that exist to welcome this fusion of human and robot, and we've seen some success with people like Neil Harbison. Who is that, you might ask? Neil Harbison was born with a chromatopsia, which is a severe kind of color blindness that allows him only to see in black and white. And through an electronic eye called an eyeborg, Neil can see now with color. He perceives colors as sounds, seeing an entire musical scale. So yes, he can hear color. But what's fascinating is that his brain has adapted to this device by forming new neural pathways to facilitate this evolution in perception. You could say this guy is effectively part robot, and think about the wide-scale implications of that. This also brings up moral issues for some people. What's the line? Like, if we extrapolate, where does human end and robot begin? It's like the now decades-old morality debate around androids. Consider Westworld. It's a simple idea. Westworld was a theme park that's overrun by androids, and these androids were originally designed to fulfill the wants and needs of park guests. But in the end, they take over, and they become indistinguishable from actual humans, but they hunt down the actual humans. Sci-fi loves to posit stories of us, creating technology where robots are indistinguishable from humans, but subjugated because of who they really are. 
that's actually part of the storyline of AI and Ex Machina, and I don't think this theme is going anywhere anytime soon. Since the Hall of Presidents attraction at Disney World launched in 1971, there's been a fascination with employing our Android friends to entertain us. The Hall of Presidents used then state-of-the-art animatronics to bring the presidents of yore to life. And it currently has 45 robots on display. It's actually now a presidential tradition to be recorded while you're in office so your speech can be added to your Disney robot. You may not realize this, but having a wax-like speaking robot made of you is actually a presidential perk. President Joe Biden is currently being added to the attraction at the time of this episode's recording. And there's actually some groundbreaking history within the attraction itself. The Lincoln robot that recites the Gettysburg Address was shown at the 1964 World's Fair. And according to Disney, this Lincoln was the world's first ever audio animatronics figure in human form. In other words, the first speaking android. Cool, Disney. However, as with anything android, you hit an uncanny valley pretty quickly. The uncanny valley is a term that describes the creepy or the disgusted feeling that you get when you see something badly done, uh, particularly used in visual effects in movies when attempting to create a virtual human. The problem is that the creation falls between looking something like a virtual effects character, which is kind of cute, and human, which is normal, uh, but it results in a strange in-between place that's off-putting. And it's most likely an evolutionary response of survival advantage to be able to identify what is human and what is not. But robots that are trying too hard to be human are infamous for triggering this response where we feel like it's a little cringy. The internet rejoices in trolling these creepy bots. And much like with AI music, that sounds a little weird, uh, like the weird pseudo Beatles song I played in the last episode, robots that try to pass as human and fail are going to trigger that same feeling in us. So, in my opinion, there are really two paths forward with designing bots so they don't provoke that reaction. We either have to make them so unbelievably human-like that people cannot tell the difference, aka achieve the technology of Westworld, or we go in the opposite direction. We make something that's easy and palatable. We make robots cute, but we don't make them realistic. Pepper the Robot by SoftBank is a great example. According to SoftBank, Pepper is a robot designed for people, built to connect with them, assist them, share knowledge with them, while helping your business in the process. They call her a semi-humanoid, but straight out of an anime with big eyes and exaggerated expressions, and she would never be confused for a human. She's distinctly her own thing. There's a reward center for us in our brain that gets activated by cute stimuli, like cartoon characters with big eyes or the kitten videos on YouTube. And the reason for this is evolutionary. It's related to our young. What has big eyes, small noses, chubby cheeks, and a big head in relation to the rest of its body? Our babies. And to make parents want to take the effort and energy to take care of babies, it is evolutionarily advantageous for otherwise defenseless babies to look really cute. See also Golden Retriever Puppies, Baby Penguins, or the anime character Totoro for a more reward center lighting up cute things. Our brains like to interact with things that we find cute. So if you're designing a robot and you want people to like it, or at the very least not get totally freaked out by it, take your inspiration from cute things in nature which are pleasing and read as non-threatening to the humans interacting with the robots. As with part one of our three-part series here, I'm realizing that my conclusion about the robot body is once again this. Robots are awesome, but robots stop being awesome when we try to make robots into humans. Let's let robots play to their strength and let us humans play to ours. And the good news about the bad news of robots taking over so many jobs, particularly in the industrial sector, is that we see it coming. We have time to reorganize ourselves, come up with new ideas, creative solutions for automation's effect on our economy. I don't think anybody doubts that the world is going to be all around more automated in the near future, and that can be scary. The thing that we have to remember is that humanity will always have value. The most posh hotels in the world are not the ones that are automated. People always put a premium on human interaction. The better the restaurant the more waiters and waitresses there are circling your table, ensuring your glass is never empty, making you feel like a special guest. That's going to be hard to replicate with an Android. It just is. 
The fully automated restaurants, like the cool little no-human-interaction ramen joints in Tokyo, they're fun, but nobody would argue that they're meant to be a high-end experience. Humans need humans. But we can form symbiotic relationships with the bots, and I think we totally should, because working together with robots allows them to help us help ourselves, and it prevents a full-blown apocalyptic robot takeover by our Roombas. Thank you for listening to Innovation 19. Like many other podcasters, we're using Post by Futuri to create, publish, and optimize this episode. Learn more about why some of the world's top brands rely on Post to power their podcasts at futurimedia.com.